third, from what we've seen of the progression of events during the tribulation up to this point, it seems reasonable to assume that the time period specified in this next verse will fall primarily within the second half of the tribulation, ending only when the tribulation itself is all but over. Then the woman, this would be Israel, fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they would feed her there one thousand two hundred and sixty days. Revelation twelve six. When the Antichrist makes his wannabe God move, the Jews in Israel who had recognized Yahweh's miraculous preservation of their nation from the armies of Gog will say, No way, Jose, or something similarly politically incorrect. And as we read in Mark's rendition of the Olivet Discourse, they'll know it's time to run for their lives. Note that the time period is precisely the same length of ministry as the two witnesses, but again, it isn't specifically stated to be the same 1,260 days. Fourth, there will be a dark period when believers, in context, specifically the believing Jews, will have no power on earth to defend themselves when Satan will be given free reign on earth. One said to the man clothed in linen, apparently an angel, How long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Then I heard the man clothed in linen swear that it will be for a time, times, and half a time, and when the power of the set-apart people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. Daniel 12, 6 and 7. When this time, the time of Jacob's trouble, is over, all these things shall be finished. In other words, the three and a half year period comes at or very near the end of the tribulation. Yahshua's final coming brings it to an end. So far, we have a collection of seemingly quasi-unrelated statistics. Seven months to bury the dead, 42 months for the Gentiles to tread the holy city underfoot, three and a half years for the saints to be given into the hand of the Antichrist, 1,260 days for the two witnesses to prophesy, time, times, and half a time, or three and a half years, when God's holy people will have no power at all, and 1,260 days for Israel's fleeing multitudes to be sustained and protected by Yahweh in the wilderness. But it seems reasonable to roughly equate the woman's, that is Israel's, 1,260-day flight into the wilderness, the three and a half years of helplessness, and the 42 months in which the Gentiles will tread the holy city underfoot. The very reason the Gentiles are there and in control is that the Jews, many of them, have fled for their lives. We have also been told that the Antichrist will bring the temple sacrifices to an end in the middle of the seven-year tribulation. We read that in Daniel 9.27. Incredibly, Daniel, at the end of his ministry, gives us even more precise timing for the abomination of desolation. Many shall be purified, made white, and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. He begins by telling us what we've seen elsewhere, that some of the Jews will come to repentance at this time, and some will dig in their heels. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away, and the abomination of desolation is set up, note that he has hereby equated the two things, there shall be 1,290 days. What? Not 1,260 days? Nope, there's an extra month here. I believe that the prophet is saying that the abomination of desolation, the self-declaration in the temple by the Antichrist that he is God and that the world must worship him, will occur precisely one month before the midpoint of the tribulation, leaving 1,290 days to go until... Until what? It just says there shall be 1,290 days. The only possible meaning is until the end of the tribulation, until the beginning of the millennial reign of the Messiah. 
Perhaps this means that at the time of the abomination of desolation, a 30-day deadline is set for the inhabitants of Israel to bow to the image of the beast, to pledge allegiance to him, and receive the mark. It makes sense that the Antichrist would begin imposing his will there, planning to work his way through the rest of the world in successive waves. Doing Europe or America on such a short deadline would seem an impossible task, but Israel, the world headquarters of the beast is certainly small enough to serve as a test market. Besides, truth be known, it's the only patch of ground Satan cares about, because it's the only place with which Yahweh has personally identified himself. The devil is nothing if not predictably covetous. Bottom line, the Jews have a 30-day window, max, in which to beat a retreat into the wilderness, where Yahweh has promised, as we saw in Revelation 12.6, to protect them from the jealous rage of the jilted false messiah. But Daniel isn't done. The angel tells him, Blessed is he who waits, and comes to the one thousand three hundred and thirty-five days. But you, go your way till the end, for you shall rest, and will arise to your inheritance at the end of these days. Daniel twelve ten through 13 You shall rest? Yeah, Daniel probably died from the headache all these dates gave him. 1,335 days? From when? From the same event specified in the previous verse, that is, the abomination of desolation. But this puts us past the end of the tribulation, doesn't it? Yes, by 45 days. Apparently, the returning Messiah is giving himself 45 days to clean house, as it's described in Matthew 25, to separate the sheep from the goats. The first month and a half of the millennium will be used to judge those people who are still alive on planet Earth. We're only talking about the timing here. The subject is going to have to wait for a future chapter. Still confused? (laughs) Good, I'm not the only one. With the information we've just reviewed, let's go back and construct a possible timeline. I'll have to make educated guesses for the significant but unspecified milestones, of course. The tribulation is to last for seven years. See Daniel 9.27. So, seven times 360 is 2,520 days total. Here's the first half. Day 1. The seven-year covenant with many is confirmed by the Antichrist. The UN assumes its peacekeeping role. Day 2. Gog begins secret talks designed to unify the Islamic world against Israel. Day 30. The Jews break ground on their new temple site. Day 90. The Antichrist sets up personal headquarters in Israel to monitor UN peacekeepers or possibly to serve himself as the special representative. Day 300. The third temple is completed on Mount Moriah and the Levitical liturgy is restored. Other shrines are in progress. Day 340. Gog's forces in Iran, Iraq, Turkey, etc. begin to assemble. Day 360. Egypt and Syria attack Israel in a coordinated surprise military action. Day 361, Antichrist's forces strike back. Day 400, the Antichrist forces push Egypt and Syria back to Israel's borders. Day 470, Antichrist sweeps across the Sinai and enters Egypt. Day 500, Egypt surrenders. Day 520, Gog's Islamic allies in northern and eastern Africa begin gathering their troops. Day 590, Ethiopian, Sudanese, and Libyan armies clash with the Antichrist's forces. Day 630, the Antichrist fights the African Islamic armies to a standstill. Day 650, Syria attacks Israel with nerve gas. The missiles are blown off course, making Jordan a wasteland. Day 680, the Antichrist, alarmed at Gog's armies assembling north of Israel, leaves Africa and prepares to meet them. Day 700, Gog's forces begin their sweep into Israel through Lebanon and Syria. Day 720, Saudi Arabia, the United States, and others lodge formal protests at the U.N., 
Day 750. Hampered by UN forces, Gog makes a flanking maneuver through Jordanian territory. Day 780. Gog's African allies cross the Sinai toward Israel. Day 800. Gog's forces close in on Jerusalem. The Antichrist is powerless to stop their advance. The Israelis fight valiantly but are close to being overwhelmed. Day 810. Yahweh miraculously destroys Gog's armies within Israel with fire, brimstone, floods, an earthquake, and fratricide. Day 815, Israelis begin the burial of Gog's armies. Day 820, the Antichrist sends nuclear missiles to Syria, Iran, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia. Day 825, the Antichrist nukes other Muslim nations. Day 830, Russia retaliates and sends nukes to Europe. America issues warnings. Day 850, the Antichrist nukes the Vatican. America reacts as predicted and nukes Russia. Day 855, Russia commences nuclear strikes on America. Day 880, the Apophis meteorite strikes. Commercial Babylon falls. Day 1025, the Israelis complete the burial of Gog's armies and the collection of its war material. Day 1100, the last nuclear weapon is detonated. Day 1230, the abomination of desolation. The mark of the beast is instituted and the Jews flee from Jerusalem. Day 1251, the two witnesses begin prophesying. Day 1260, the midpoint, the Gentiles take over Jerusalem. We'll deal with the second half in the coming chapters. You'll find a similar wrap-up of Great Tribulation events at the end of chapter 24. And in case you're wondering if it's possible to assign real dates to these events, rather than mere sequence and time interval observations, it is. But there's a caveat. You have to make a few assumptions that are not specifically spelled out in so many words in Scripture, or if they are, are not recognized for the truths they represent by the vast majority of Christians today. A list of these assumptions and the chronological data that emerge if they're true, as I believe they are, can be found in the appendix section. Make sure you're sitting down when you read it. Please remember, the tribulation is only the end of the beginning. A new day, a new eternity follows. I know it looks exceedingly grim at this point, and it's going to get worse before it gets better. But for the children of Yahweh, physical death is just a temporary glitch.